Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 to 7. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is, we'll come to it here in a little bit. It's a very, uh, I found it to be a very peculiar, not peculiar maybe, but very outstanding reading, comparing it to what God was accomplishing in the beginning and even God's relationship to humanity and mankind throughout the years, but now something has, uh, something has climaxed, something has culminated. And we'll just, uh, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Amen. You may be seated. What thrilling uh, scripture reading. Uh, and then me kind of knowing which way, I, which direction I'm headed, and hopefully we get it. Just is even more thrilling uh, to look at that. We're continuing on the subject of God created. It's an outflow of Genesis 1:1. In the beginning, God created. And I'm wanting to, I'm just going to take time uh, this morning really to recapture where we had stopped last time in the. Uh, in the area of subdue, how this commandment and this commission was given. But I just want to background a few things from the last couple services at the outset so that we can have um, some context for this. And <clears throat> the first few chapters of the Bible, we've been looking at maybe the first three. The more I've pondered it, the more I just want to start saying the first four, the first five, uh, maybe even get all the way up to Genesis chapter 12 when we introduce Abram. Uh, those first several chapters just setting up God's plan and story of redemption. But these first few chapters of the Bible lay a foundation for understanding really what is the mystery of God. Uh, because God, an unknown being, an unknown entity, uh, is making Himself known through Scripture. And so as things unfold, we see things that God does and things that God says. So there's something that's being declared, but yet there's still kind of a mystery uh, to what he is doing and what he's trying to accomplish. And so when we look at creation, Brother Branham used this phrase, we see what he is in his program. The creator is letting himself be known what he is in his program. And we've been specifically over the last couple of services looking at how this is a story of redemption. And the story of redemption begins in Genesis, but not where we might think it begins. We think, oh, the moment that Eve fell, that's when the story of redemption begins. But the story of redemption begins with, in the beginning, God created. That's where the story of redemption begins. And so we're looking at the story of redemption and how that even within this story of redemption, though things can be very plain and they're described in a particular way, there's a mystery that's hid within it. And so this is, uh, as you begin to read the Bible, we cannot read it just as a history, but it's God telling His story. So it is His story, but not history. It is God telling something about Himself. It's divine love being portrayed, divine love being expressed. And we, we're taking, taking time just to point out how everything that God was doing, and this is a very, I would even it just be it, admit to you, it's even a fresher revelation to me than it's ever been, because you take Genesis and you think this is perfection, the perfection of perfection. Everything that God's trying to achieve, everything God's trying to accomplish, it's all perfect. It's in its radiance, it's in its glory. And then when man falls, redemption begins. But it goes back even before that. This is redemption. Because everything that God created, everything that He fashioned, everything that was formed by God, He did it with redemption in mind. So what we see unfold in Genesis is not the accident of sin. This is not an accident. Because Brother Branham tells us very plainly in that church age book, when Satan did that which was necessary to bring about the purpose of God. So God allowed things to be into place 
things to be in a particular position so that Satan would act of his own will and in doing so set certain things in motion so that the story of redemption could be told. So it's no accident of sin. And we've been emphasizing this, that God's purpose could not have been revealed without redemption. If we had all stepped forth fresh from God, then there would have been no doubt a perfect existence, but the paradox is we wouldn't have perfectly known God. There still would have been something about God that would have been missing or lacking. So if there was only one Eden, what would God mean to us? If there was never any sorrow, what, what, what would be... Uh, what would that, that, think about how God's desire to be a comforter. If there's, no, if there's no sorrow, then God's desire and need to be a comforter is imprisoned. If there's no sickness, then God's attribute of being a healer is imprisoned. It's in bondage. So there's things that had to happen for God to be able to express Himself. So if we had only known one Eden, then what would God be to us? He would be God, and we would worship Him just as angels would worship Him, but He wouldn't be known to the, His people as He desired to make Himself known. Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, and that, that backgrounds, we're still going to be backgrounding some things, but this is, I really want this to become the main cog that we uh, press forward from, because we're looking at God created. Now, as we, as we look at this, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, I want you to realize this is God speaking now to the, so, the totality of His creation. And so this is what God created. This is the desire He had for His creation. This is how He begins to arrange in these few verses here. If we took more than verse 28, we'll find that God's arranging creation to one another and among one another. And now God's speaking to the man with the woman inside of him, and God blessed them. The blessing confers power, and God blessed them. What He says unto them is the blessing. It's not like the Pope doing a little thing with his hand or, you, or some kind of something being sprinkled on somebody. This is, and God bless them. What He's about to say is the blessing. It confers power. It conveys ability. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. This is God's blessing on what He has created. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then we come to verse 28, and this is God even before He sums it up in the beginning of Genesis chapter 2. He's saying, this is my creation. This is the sum of it. I'm blessing man who's the pinnacle of this. And now He's going to have a particular arrangement over everything that I've created. Now, this blessing and this commandment is left unfulfilled. And we're, we've been mentioning that several times, and we're going to continue to emphasize that this morning. Because the principles of redemption, or if I could say the mystery of redemption, would not allow Genesis 1.28 to be fulfilled without suffering. Now, we can look back and say, that's just exactly how it happened. That this could not have been fulfilled and was not fulfilled until first sorrow and death entered into humanity. But I want to emphasize it that it could not have been fulfilled unless first there was some interruption within this perfection, some interruption within this harmony that was in the garden. Because everything that is meant by Genesis 1.28, it was not something that God wanted man just to easily grasp. That for man just to be able to fulfill all these things and do all these things. There was something that had to take place to put man in a character to be able to fully fulfill Genesis 1.28. And so when man fell, the power of Genesis 128, the commission or blessing of Genesis 128 is taken away from mankind. And we could say that it was even sealed from him. And Brother Bram talks about how those great powers lay dormant and these things that he had this ability to do. He can no longer access them. Whatever means by which he could not access them, whatever means by which he no longer was, they were no longer available to him to use, God seals man off from the blessing, the power, and the potential of Genesis 1.28. But this is part of God's predestinated plan called redemption. It's not that this is an accident all of a sudden, but it's part of God's plan, and it was necessary for God's purpose. And so Brother Beta makes this statement in the message oneness. When Adam and Eve listened to the lie of the devil, this is a very heavy statement to me. I can still remember the first time I ever heard it. It says, the holy image of God left them. So man's made in the image of God. He's made in the likeness of God. Though he retains particular, a particular likeness and a particular image of God after the fall, 
There's the holy, a holy image that leaves man as soon as he listens to the lie of the devil. And hold that deep within your heart that man lost something the moment he believed a lie. And it says, and their fellowship was broken with God. He describes it this way. Their fellowship of oneness with God was broken. The very minute they listened to the lie of the devil, that broke their fellowship. So now think of the totality of this very short statement. And if you listen to the message, oneness, Brother Branham, it really emphasizes the theme uh, quite a bit in there. Adam's oneness and the oneness of man. And that's God's desire is, is to have oneness with his creation. Not just to have a creation, but to experience oneness and a to to total union with his creation. But it says the holy image of God leaves Adam and the woman the very moment they listen to the lie of the devil. So man loses that, that God-likeness. Some God quality, some divine deity that, was, that he had some fellowship with, that he had communion with, that he had access to, that leaves man, and it says that breaks their fellowship. He calls it the fellowship of oneness. So man is no longer one with God. He may still be like God, and he may still uh, be in an image of God, but this holy image leaves him something about the divine power, something about the divine intent and notions have left man, and he's no longer one with God. Now, he can call upon God. He can feel his presence, and God can even still communicate with man, but something is lost in man's relationship with God through the fall. So many different statements I'd like to read, and I want, I'm going to read several of them. But Brother Bram says, God in harmony with His creature and the creature in harmony with His maker. That's the way it was in the beginning. God was in harmony with His creature and the creature was in harmony with His maker. That's how man was at the start. But as soon as he listens to the lie of the devil, it's disharmony. So now there is no longer perfect harmony between God and the creature nor can the creature have perfect harmony with his maker. This is interrupted, and when the harmony is gone, the oneness is gone. When the harmony is gone, the holy image cannot be expressed. There's something that distorts or perverts that likeness, or we could even put it in a way that might even be better for us to understand. As soon as there was a breach within the character of man, he's no longer fit just to grab a hold of the power of God and use it like he would want to. And Brother Branham, is the holy image of God leaves Adam and the woman, their fellowship of oneness. Think of that, fellowship of oneness and the holy image. Keep those two ideas in mind. The holy image of God departs from the creature. The fellowship of oneness with God is broken. And then Brother Branham says, our health, our strength, our eternal spirit was lost in Adam. So here's things that were lost when Adam fell. Our health, our strength, and our eternal spirit was lost in Adam. So there's something that's removed from man and man is separated from. And it would have been a very eerie, very odd feeling. And that's when you find in Genesis 3 when man sinned, all of a sudden fear enters in for the first time because he only knew fellowship of oneness. He only knew the holy image of God. As long as he had the holy image, fear couldn't get in. As long as he had this fellowship of oneness with God, if there was no fear around him at all. As soon as that leaves, the first emotion he experiences is fear. So our health, our strength, our eternal spirit was lost in Adam. Yeah. Now in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, and I know it may seem to be, uh, it might seem just to be kind of very uh, plotting uh, course that we're doing today, uh, but I, I believe that it's going to be a blessing to you as we are able to go hopefully uh, deep into this. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When man became a living soul, he now gives him affinity to the animals, all living creatures upon the earth, because it's the same phrase used for living creature, of those that creep, creep upon the earth, the fowl, the fish, those things. Man now has an affinity by having the breath of life. Man becomes a living soul. He becomes a kinsman now, even to creation. But then it also says that God formed him from the dust of the ground. So now he's given a physical body. Now to put this in context of Genesis chapter 1, the blessing. Genesis 1.28 had two parts. There was a commission related to him as a man or mankind as, this, as, as Adam and the woman that would come from him. They are told and commanded to be fruitful and multiply. So they're to become many, they're to have progeny, they're to have those after them. So this commission related specifically to them as, a, as an entity, as a being, as even as a spirit. 
But the second part of the blessing or this commandment was a commission related to their power over all things in the earth and also all things from the earth. As they are told to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. This is a commission related to their power over all living things. Everything that had life, anything that was growing, anything that was breathing, walking, moving, anything God had created. Really, we could just say anything God created, they're given power and dominion over it. But then they're also given a commandment to replenish and subdue the earth. So now they're given a power over all things from the earth. And when it says man is formed from the dust of the ground, this flesh body that God gives man, it connects Adam to the power to replenish and subdue the earth. Because where did the body come from? Thank you. We'll just turn this over and we'll preach to Brother John. The body came from the earth. So man is formed from the dust of the ground. He's formed from the earth. And now this flesh body that Adam is placed within connects him to the power to replenish the earth and subdue the earth. So now the body becomes a part of the blessing. The blessing is be fruitful, multiply. Well, there's a, it's conceivable that he could have multiplied spiritually. It could have been other spiritual beings, just like Adam in the image of God, in the likeness of God, supernatural beings without flesh. But when God forms man from the dust of the ground, he's connecting everything together. Man becomes kinsman to the earth. Man has a body like, uh, uh, um, like these other animal bodies. And Brother Man talks about he has a hand like a bear. And you describe him in all these different ways where man has some affinity to creation. But now also man has a direct connection to the earth. Not just a supernatural being, spiritual being, but now the very body that he inhabits. Man is formed from the dust of the ground, and now man has, pow- has, has a connection with the earth that he is told to replenish and to subdue. And so now the body becomes part of that blessing. Brother Branham makes this statement, and, and if it doesn't seem like these are connecting, I think there'll be a point where maybe we'll just put the grout over all of it and it'll seem like it connects. But Brother says, Adam lost the rights of that book. So when he fell, when he lost his harmony with his maker, and our health, our strength, our eternal spirit was lost in Adam, he lost rights to that book. What was that book? The book of redemption. The title deed to heaven and earth. The power and control over everything. He lost that. So man lost, when he says he lost his rights to that book, man lost his full rights to the earth. And all of creation. He would, have had a, he would have had a dominion and control by the word of God. Not by his own volition, his own savviness. And he's smarter than the serpent. And he's smarter than all the beast. And he can trick them. By divine power, God had conferred into Adam the ability to control all things. But as soon as he fell, he lost his full rights to the earth. He lost his full power over all of creation. And let me say this, including his body. His brother Ram says our eternal spirit was lost in Adam. This, this, the ability, any ability this body may have had to live forever and not die, he loses that at the fall. Now there's a peculiar scripture in Jude 9. There's no chapters to Jude. You could say Jude chapter 1 verse 9, but there's just, since there's no chapters to it, it's Jude verse 9. It speaks this, and it's a very peculiar scripture within Uh, theological circles and and Christendom and they try to find the origins of it and there was different ancient books, the Assumption of Moses and different things that they feel that maybe Jude is drawing from. But it says, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So Jude in context is talking about how... um, you would wrangle with the adversary, the things that you would say, or the, the things that you would say, uh, the, the things that people even say of dignities and things that are holy. And, and he's saying, man, you, you shouldn't say certain things. He says, even Michael, when he was arguing with uh, uh, the devil, just said, the Lord rebuke thee. But in this context, notice what he says, that Michael is contending with the devil over the body of Moses. Now, why would there be an argument with Satan over the body of Moses? Because of the fall, Satan would have asserted a right to Moses' body. And so Satan and Michael and the archangel are arguing over the body of Moses because when man fell, man lost his first claim to the earth. 
He could no longer, this body coming from the earth, he couldn't just assert his right with the title deed. He says, no, see, this body, I own it. So that when this body now, when he loses that title deed, then an accusation could be brought. If you don't have the deed to your house, if you don't have a lease or a deed, you don't have something that proves you own it, then have fun arguing it, right? Say, well, I, I live here. Okay, you live there, but do you own it? And I would, I would argue that possession is nine-tenths of the law, and if you're living there, you, you got pretty solid footing at least for some period of time. But the argument, who owns it? Who, ha, who has a right to it? So Satan asserts his right to the body of Moses because when man fell, he doesn't even have clear title to his own body. Now ponder that. Ponder how significant this is now. When man dies, he loses this power to his own body so that when Moses dies, God hides the body of Moses as we read from the message and, and even understanding from Scripture, whether it would be to keep Israel from being tempted to idolatry. Brother Branham using it, uh, using it in a beautiful sense that this is now Moses being resurrected, as it were, being preserved. We see him again on Mount Transfiguration. But Satan asserts his right to the body because it came from the earth and man has lost his rights to the earth. The power he had to replenish, to subdue, the blessing of Genesis 1.28 is withdrawn from man. So now there's an argument over even the body. In the breach, Brother Branham says, Adam lost his inheritance, the earth. That was his part of his inheritance. The inheritance, it was granted to him in Genesis 1.28. It was God's to begin with, correct? Then God creates this. This is God's legacy, and He leaves it with man. He says, it's yours. That was His inheritance. He inherited it from God. He says, now, so Adam lost his inheritance, the earth. And remember, man is formed not just as a supernatural being from God in the image and likeness of God, but he's also brought up from the earth. So see the two meet together, the divine deity, supernatural heaven, coming now together with earth, and man is formed together. So man comes from the earth, and he loses his inheritance, the earth. But it says, now it passed from his hand to the one he sold out to, Satan. The earth is now passed. He sold his faith in God to Satan's reasonings. Therefore, his eternal life, you following me so far, his eternal life, his right to the tree of life, these are things he lost, his right to the earth belonged to him. I'm wanting you to understand this connection that God had given man to the earth. His right to the earth belonged to him. And he forfeited it every bit to the hands of Satan. He passed it from his hand to Satan. It returned and has been polluted. And the seed of Adam has destroyed the inheritance that Adam should have had. That's the earth. So when Adam fell, he forfeits the earth. To Satan. Now what he does not forfeit is the title deed. He's forfeiting possession. Satan's a squatter. Satan has moved in on a, on a vacant piece of a vacant house and he's he's there uh, uh, not even under the color of title necessarily. He's just there and he's invaded the earth and he's possessing it and he's manipulating it and he's abusing it and he's abusing man that's come from the earth and that's because Adam when he fell he now forfeits his rights to the earth and now Satan comes and begins to assume control over it, just using maybe summary language in doing so. But the title deed, the power, Genesis 1.20, the blessing, that doesn't go to Satan. Anybody believe that? Amen. Did not go to Satan. The title deed went back to the hands of the original owner. So the title deed, the power, the book of redemption, that sealed book, however you want to describe it, that goes back to the hands of God. But now that book being absent from creation puts the whole world into chaos and into a power struggle. Because man, man can't just sit there and say, no, stop, you can't do that, and have all power of heaven behind him. Now there's, there's fightings, there's wars, there's going to be murders and killings, and there's going to be ebbs and flows, and there's going to be... Seasons of triumph and righteousness in Israel, but then seasons of depravity and the whole world is chaotic and turned upside down. Why? Man lost his inheritance and this whole inheritance actually comes into the power of Satan. What is Satan called in Scripture? Prince of the power of the air. He's called the spirit. There's a spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He's called the God of this evil age. Brother Branham describes all of creation now as Satan's Eden. 
Now, he doesn't have the power. He doesn't have Genesis 1.28. He doesn't have full total control as a divine entity or in the same way that Adam would have had it in the beginning. But the earth, which one time belonged to Adam, it is now forfeited into the hands of Satan. Right. <clears throat> now, in the message, Fundamental Foundation for Faith, and this is another sermon that you can go back and listen to, and you'll find Brother Branham touching on some of these points that we're making even in these last few services. Brother Branham says, Man in the fall has lost his conscience of what Father put him here on earth to do. This is one of, those out, the, one of these outstanding statements to me this morning as we go through this. When man fell, he lost his conscience of what Father put him here on earth to do. Could you just remember that? Just take that first sentence there. And think about that, that what Brother Branham is saying is that when man fell, he's no longer aware and fully understanding what he was put on earth to do. He's still going to eat, still going to have kids, still going to build and, and, and propagate, and there's going to be a lot of things that happen, but he's, he forgot what he was put on earth to do. Though he may be accomplishing things, and though there is a... a um, a history that unfolds and man procreates and man builds and man controls the earth and he does all sorts of things to creation, but he forgets what he was put on earth to do. He has forgotten Genesis 1.28. Because this is the only place that you find where God gives him something specifically to do. Now you could look at the prohibitions of partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and you could look at how he was given certain things to eat, but when it comes to what you to do, your marching orders, your duty. Adam, it's Genesis 1.28. When he falls, he loses his consciousness of what his commission is. Brother Brown says, in other words, all the plumbing as it was in our brain, and that's sometimes how we feel about our brain, it's just a bunch of plumbing, and the outlets, the faith has been clogged up with business affair, with home life, domestic things. It's all become so clogged up with that until God can't operate through those channels that He made a man for so man was made for God to operate through man. And the fall essentially blocks God off from being able to operate through our channels. There's no clear channel or clear consciousness that I am a divine representative upon earth. I am divine. I am deity. I am God upon earth. I have been given a, a, a commandment to be fruitful, multiply, replenish, and subdue the earth. I have dominion over every living thing on the earth. I have all power over heaven and earth. I'm here as a divine entity. I'm here in the stead of God. I have this divine character. I have the mind of Christ. I can operate, and then God has this oneness. The holy image of God is in flesh. The fellowship of oneness between God and His creation. And now you just have deity being expressed. As soon as man falls, it, it vacates him. And he doesn't even know what he's called to do. He can say those things. But the harmony is not there. The oneness isn't there. The connection isn't there. And Brother Branham continues. This is so beautiful. When God made the human body, every little part had its place to play. So the, the, the body had a purpose to it. He says the teeth, the tongue, the eyes, the nose. God does everything in there to make it perfect in operation to make the man to live. And he continues and says, if he gave that much thought to your body, how much more the body of Christ? And that's the point that he's trying to make because that's ultimately what God's going to accomplish. But what God put man here on earth to do, man lost his conscience his channels become clogged. There's no free flow of the divine into the nature of man. And the human body, which was to have everything, the teeth, the eyes, the tongue, the nose, was to have a place to play. God put it there to be in perfect operation for that man to live within creation. Now something is lost. Harmony and unity is lost. And because of this, man is no longer capable of fulfilling the commission of Genesis 1.28. Man can't do it. Man's still upon earth. The commission seemingly is lingering there. But because man can no longer fulfill the commission of Genesis 1.28, God has to recommission him. So in Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them. Now this is from... It's from these three sons that we know the whole earth is populated. By one blood, God has made the whole earth uh, to be filled up with humanity. It's coming from this blood 
that comes forth from the ark. And so now this is all of humanity, all of creation, starting anew, as it were, after the flood. We could call it a, a, a new world, even though I think you could refer to the world that was destroyed as the new world, and now this is a, a subsequent world. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, notice the, how similar this sounds, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hands are they delivered. Now, it may sound the same, but it's very different. Man is told to have dominion over the fish, over the fowl, and over living, every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now there's just a dread upon every living thing. So it's not, it's not a continuity of subjection in harmony between the man and creation or man and creature, but now there's a dread, there's a fear, there's something that has interrupted the initial harmony. The man and the lion could have walked together, the tiger and the bear would have all had this harmony, but now this is all going to be upset, but God is going to say, now there's going to be the dread of you upon the animal life. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. This is different than what was said before. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will, require, will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So there's still something special about the visage of man. The, the, the body of man, the, the nature of man. There's still something special about it. So God is uh, preserving it and sanctifying it and, and setting it as special that it ought not to be taken. Though you may eat uh, every moving thing that moves shall be meat for you. There's a, a division that's made amongst the flesh with life thereof. And how you shall not take another man's life. And, because man is in the image of God. In verse 7 again, And you be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth. And multiply therein. Now, as you read that, would you, you could, we could agree that it's very familiar to what's said in Genesis 1:28. But what's missing? There's no commission to subdue. It's very similar in the have dominion over the fish and the fowl and every living thing that moveth. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. The very phrase is there. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Be fruitful, multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth. Multiply therein. But God is very purposeful because He has not told them to subdue it. He has not given them power to subdue. Because what is being said here represents a new order. It's not dominion over the earth as Adam had it. Because Noah and his sons are not going to sit there as a God upon earth to be able to control everything and bring things back and say, oh man, this is, a, this is a chaotic world after this flood. Let's just reverse the curse. Let's just bring things back and let's move mountains and let's do this and do that. Noah and his sons did not have that power. Though they are commissioned by God saying, I want you to multiply. You're going to bring forth seed and you're going to populate the whole earth. And from you is going to come every living known man upon the face of the earth. And I'm going to make you uh, give fear over you of every beast in the earth and every fowl of the air and everything that moves and all the fish in the sea. They're, going to, uh, they're delivered into your hands. You can, uh, those are yours uh, to wrestle with, to take as you want and for your possession. But it's not dominion like man had as a god. Can you understand that? This is, a, this is a new commission. He's not reissuing the commandment to Adam. God isn't saying, oh, here, hold on, Moses. Uh, hold on, Noah. Hold on right here. Let me find it. Yeah, Genesis 1, 28. And then recommissioning Noah and his three sons after Genesis 1, 28. This is a new commandment altogether. When God blesses Noah, he's saying this is, this is something new for humanity. This is something new for fallen man. Because by one blood, by one hybrid blood, all mankind is going to populate the whole earth. And so it's a new commandment really for a new mix of people. A hybrid people. So God has to recommission man. And he has to give them a new commandment. Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. But what's missing? No commandment to subdue the earth. <clears throat> now, are you, each one of you following me so far this morning? We're just slowly, slowly going through this. 
Now, Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. I'm looking at this to show that man in his, and this is review, this portion here is definitely review, that man in his perfection in the garden still had further expressions um, to be made. Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man as, is become as one of us to know good and evil. Plain language. Man had become something more like God. He was already made in the image of God and perfect. But now he does something and he acts a certain way. He manifests something. And in manifesting something, God says he's become as one of us. Or if I could put it this way, just if you wanted to give me um, the liberty to use this language, he's become more like us. Man has become as one of us to know good and evil. So now something, man in his perfection has taken a step further. And if we could use this phrase, he's become more perfect. Man who is like God has become more like God. Man who had the potential to express the divine has done something that in one sense is more divine than what he had had before. So God recognizes this. Then he says, and now lest he put forth his hand. So now there's something more he can do. And take also the tree life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God set him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. Why? Because man has become more like us. And now lest he put forth his hand, take of the tree of life, eat and live forever. I'm going to drive out the man. And he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. In other words, to seal man off to this, from the secret of the further glory. To seal man off from this power to take, eat, and live forever. Now, it's symbolic language. I believe it's, it's descriptive, uh, 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 and it's symbolic, and it's showing us that there was something there that man in his perfection was to walk forward in the blessing and the commandment, and as he fulfilled God's commission, as he had a consciousness of what Father put him here on earth to do, as he would act in it, he would become more godlike, express more of God. Now, if, that, if it's hard to understand that, just think of the reality that even in eternity, God's going to continue to unfold himself. He's, he's inexhaustible. So even Adam in his perfection still had more to manifest, more to accomplish, and it become a further reflection of the divine nature and God. So Adam could have walked in this consciousness of what he's placed on earth to do, and now he steps outside of the commission and acts, and God says he's still become more like us, and lest he step further and do more, I'm going to stop him from having access to the tree of life, lest he partake of that and live forever. So now God has sealed man off from the secret of further glory. Man is not going to be... A, man from that moment on has never gotten any closer to God and God likeness in his flesh. That that was the very moment that humanity is degraded and he's not moving towards perfection. He's not moving towards the kingdom. He's not moving towards a, a, a further expression of God. So this shows that there was a further expression of God likeness that could have unfolded or that was to be made manifest in Adam. Can, we, do we, can you, uh, just if, you, if you're able to just give some affirmation this morning, it would be wonderful. If, only if you understand it. I, I, don't, I don't like for amens to be prompted and say, tell someone to say amen when they can't say amen. It's a very dangerous, dangerous place to be. And so... A very dangerous position to be put in, to, to demand amens of one who cannot volunteer it of the, of the unction of the Holy Spirit. So these scriptures, man has become as one of us, shows there was a further expression of God likeness. And then for it to say, now lest he take also of the tree of life, suggests that there was more that could have developed. This is what these scriptures show to us, that there was more that was to unfold. So the power, the promise, the potential that humanity held was left unfinished. And this is, this is what we're, uh, this is really maybe what we were spending the first 30, 40 minutes just emphasizing. Is that man lost something, his harmony with his maker, the maker's harmony with his creation, our health, our strength, our eternal spirit. He lost the rights to the book. He lost his inheritance, the earth. He, all these things that he lost, his holy image of God, the fellowship of oneness with God was broken. All the power that humanity held was lost. 
All the potential that humanity stood for, all, all the promise that Adam and the woman have is left unfinished. And so was the earth. So was the earth. Brother Branham says on the third seal, who is able to come and take this book of redemption? Re referring to Revelation 5. For the whole plan of redemption from Adam, all that Adam lost, there was nothing lost until Adam. And after Adam, all was lost in the earth. Everything on the creation of the earth was lost. This is where, this is all coming in view to me. When it, 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 as God has inspired this, God created. In the beginning, God created. God's creation is lost. The, the potential of it, the promise of it, what he wanted to do with it. Things are being lost. He says, all Adam was lost. Was, after Adam, all was lost in the earth. Everything on the creation of the earth was lost. And everything fell with Adam. Crossed the chasm. No one could get back. No way at all. Man, when he sinned, he left his way. He left no way back for himself. So there is now a... Uh, uh, the... Power of mankind lays dormant. All the promise that he had, everything that he could do. You talk about wasted talent and all that had such potential. It's gone. And it's not only just Adam as a man, but the earth feels the same loss. Everything the earth was to do, everything the earth was to be, everything, all the potential, this beautiful, perfect harmony between creator and creation and, and the, the maid and the maker. All oh, it's all oh, this is so amazing. This is so wonderful. It's all lost all of a sudden. Humanity's left on the purpose of humanity. What Father put him here on earth to do is left unfinished. And what he was supposed to do related to the earth, therefore the earth's potential is left unsatisfied. But from the beginning, God was aiming for something glorious. And because that was his aim, he's going to hit it. <laughs> That's the beautiful part. From the beginning, God was aiming. In the beginning, God created. He was aiming for something glorious, and God will do it. Right. Just say He won't. God's going to do it. God's going to accomplish it. Because in Revelation chapter 21, let's read this now. I think this just means so much more to me to read it here in this context of what we just went through. Because even after we read in Genesis 9... How there's a, a world, new world order and a commission given to Noah. And it follows this order that was given to Adam. From Genesis 3 to Genesis 9, we just see the upheaval and turmoil and tearing down of, of God's creation. And then even after the new world order, we see mankind is just further thrown into a, a, a confusion and chaos of Babel and everything. But this... This creation of God from the beginning. This, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the so quick undoing of all of it. And all the potential and the promise and the power. And man, what he's supposed to be to his maker. And creation, what it's supposed to be to man. And all this big, beautiful picture. All of it's lost. But now you get to Revelation 21. And remember those parallels that you could bring out between Genesis and Revelation? It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Now, what was Brother Branham points out to us? It's not annihilated and gone, but renovated, redeemed. Amen. It's passed away. The, the, the former elements and the things that were imperfect, there's a new heaven, a new earth. These original spoken word attributes of God, uh, that anything that was perverted, anything that was unsavory, anything that was not part of the original has been purged out, and it's a new heaven and a new earth renovated. Remade, re re renovated, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We've gone through these things, through these first several uh, services in this subject. And he says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Now, this is beautiful. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. This is this fellowship of oneness being restored back to man. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. What is this? The holy image of God being united back together. The tabernacle of God. God, not only the tabernacle of God with men, but man is the tabernacle of God. He's going to dwell in them. They're dwelling together. This is the expression of God. Where do we see Him? How do we know Him? Here He is. Man is the tabernacle of God. 
And then beautiful, beautiful verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. God is now, anything that was able to come up in Genesis 3, God's dealt with it. Gone, it's over. Where did death come in? Genesis 3. Where does it end? Revelation 21, it's gone. Where does sorrow come in? Genesis 3. Where do we know it's completely gone and no more? Revelation 21. Verse 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. The same God in the beginning who created now says, I make all things new. The very God who formed man of the dust of the ground, the very one who made all things that are, the very one that made all of creation, now is declaring something that is glorious. I make all things new. Now consider what is now made and what's represented in Revelation 21 compared to what was made in Genesis 1 and 2. And we can say this without, without a doubt at all. What he makes here will never be defiled. What he has made, I make all things new. It will never top over. It'll never go into a cycle. It'll never revert back to sorrow. It'll never revert back to death. It'll never revert back to night. I make all things new. This is what God in the beginning was foreshadowing. This is what Satan thought he had upended. But it was necessary for God to be a redeemer. So God allowed there to be a fall to the original creation. But now he says, Behold, I make all things new. And he sent unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And this verse here, 6, is, is hit me harder than it... I, it's almost as if I'd never read it before. And he said unto me, It is done. Amen. It is done. Now it is finished. Now it is accomplished. Well, I thought when we read in Genesis chapter 2, and God rested on the seventh day, he said, No, every seed's been sown. I, won't, I don't need to create... From nothing again. The spoken word original seed has been sown. And now he can say, it is done. That which I spoke in the beginning. That which was embodied in Genesis chapter 1 verse 11. That which was embodied in Genesis 1 28. That which was meant in humanity in Genesis chapter 2. All these things that I've spoke, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. It is done. I've accomplished it. What I was wanting in humanity, what I was wanting in creation, it is accomplished. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, all of creation, all that is finished, all that I've made new. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. It's the very image that God expressed in the beginning. But now it's not just a man who has stepped forth from God. But now it is one who has overcome to inherit all things. Adam lost his inheritance, the earth, but he did it without suffering. Adam had lost his inher- or had inherited the earth, but he did it without suffering. And he lost all of his inheritance to the earth. But now here's one that overcomes and inherits all things. And God is his God and he is his son. It's the very image that God had in the beginning perfected. Yes. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, it's so wonderful. I wish I had more breath in my lungs. I wish I wasn't so tired. I wish I could really just preach this. Uh, well, maybe if I was a better preacher, I could, and I'll accept that. But even now, and to whatever degree, if I'm a two on a scale of one to a hundred, I wish I was really getting a two right now to be able to convey just how perfect this picture is in my eyes, how God begins to describe the new heaven and the new earth, and how it appears to be the full development of the negative of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. It is done. I am the Alpha that was there in Genesis 1. I'm the Omega here in Genesis 21. What I set out to do, I have accomplished. Isn't that beautiful? So now, let's continue with this picture of what God's wanting to get to. We have to get there. Isn't it it beautiful to be reminded that we're, we're in this spiritual condition now? as this new Jerusalem, the bride, the body, the tabernacle of God here upon earth. Now, we ended with this statement last time, conflict between God and Satan. And you might wonder, why didn't you just start with this? The service would have been a half as long. Um, I wrestled with just what order to go in, but I felt some of these things were necessary to background this. Conflict between God and Satan. God, at the beginning, gave His children the atomic weapon because He's the infinite God. Seeing there was going to be a conflict... 
and there was going to be a battle. So did the battle surprise God? No. Did God have to scramble all of a sudden? He's like, oh, no, no, Michael, come here. Satan's in the garden. Why didn't we think of this? He's talking to the woman. What's going to happen? No, he had it all laid out there. Right. Knowing there'd be a conflict, there's going to be a battle, God equipped his children with the right kind of ammunition, right kind of attack, the right kind of everything that they would have need of. And this is the phrase to me that I trust that you never forget. That would sweep them all the way from Eden to the rapture. Isn't that statement just amazing? Isn't it precious? It's almost as if we read it and we're like, well, okay, yeah, technically the same word he gave them in the beginning. It's the same word that we use now in the end. But he's not saying it that way. He's saying that God knew there would be conflict. God knew there would be a battle. So before man ever fell and would need a resurrection, before man ever fell and would need a rapture, before man ever fell and would need redemption, God gave him a word that would do it. Before there was death, He gave him a word that could defeat death. Before there was sickness, He gave him a word that could defeat sickness. However you want to look at it is exactly what Brother Branham saying. He gave him the right kind of attack. He says, what was it? The word. He gave him a word in the beginning that would sweep them all the way from Eden as it fell. And it would be that word that would lead you to a rapture. So when did God speak the word for a rapture? Genesis 1. Spoken word is the original seed. That's why when you go back to that message, spoken word is the original seed, and you recognize that this message does not just bring us back to the day of Pentecost. This message does not just try to restore back Christian principles to the Christian church, but it brings us back to the in the beginning. Amen. Brings us back to the original purpose and nature of God. He gave them a word that would sweep them all the way from Eden in a fall to the rapture. And now let me say this. I believe it's embodied in Genesis 1.28. That's, that's when the word is given to man. It's the only place that we can read. And God bless them. And God is giving them the word of God. It's the one thing that we can see where it's embodied. It embodies all this. He gave them a word that would sweep them from Eden to the rapture. Think Genesis 1.28 would give mankind everything he would need in the earth. He was given his eyes, his nose, his teeth, everything that the body in order for him to live. He was given five senses to contact his earthly home. He had every element, everything there that he needed. He came from the earth. He had a body. Everything was there, but he needed this power now in him to operate and function within it. And God, by Genesis 1.20, gave him everything he would need to live in Eden and not just live in Eden, but take him in a rapture. The word in Genesis 1.28 that points to the rapture is this very power that he was given to subdue the earth. Amen. Multiply, replenish the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth is given to Noah, but the power to subdue is withheld from him. But in the beginning, in this original blessing and commandment, this word that he was given to sweep them all the way from Eden to the rapture, where do we find a word to sweep them to the rapture? I have given you, Adam, power to subdue the earth. Subdue means to subject, to, to, to force, to keep under, to bring under subjection. It means to dominate or tread down. Adam, I give you power to subdue the earth. Now, when we think subdue the earth, do we think just the, the dust of the earth? He's going to be able to make sand castles, or he's going to be able to build adobe huts, or he's going to be able to subject the clay, and he's going to bring seed out of it. Or does it also relate to this? Because he formed them from the dust of the earth. So the power to subdue the earth gives him power to subdue the flesh. Amen. So before even the flesh had fallen, God says, I'm going to give you power to subject it. Amen. That's what he was originally within him. He was to have that power. It's kabosh, subdue, kabosh. Put the kabosh on it. I don't know if that's exactly where they get it from. It may be Hebrew or Yiddish or something. Subdue, kabosh, to subject, to force, to keep under, to bring into subjection, to dominate and tread down. Subdue the earth, dominate it, tread it down, bring it under subjection. And Paul now uses this very language in 1 Corinthians 9.27. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. It's the exact same language that God gives Adam to subdue the earth, to keep it under, bring it into subjection. <laughs> And Paul is, I believe, picking up on this revelation that this is what man is supposed to do. 
He is to possess this vessel. He's to subdue this earth. I will keep under my body. I will bring it into subjection. I will control it, not let it control me. I will have power over it. So this, this the blessing, this power, this commandment, the word in Genesis 1.28, to subdue the earth, this promise relates to the body. And it pointed to the further glory that man was ordained to manifest. Because man acts and, and, and God says, man's become more like us. Now lest he reach forth and partake of the tree of life and live forever in what? His flesh. I'm going to stop him from doing it. So this power to subdue the flesh, this power to subdue the earth, which, is, which the flesh relates to, it point, pointed to the further glory that man could have walked in and manifested. Can I get your permission to go further? Thank you. In the message, hear ye him now. And I, I think I just want that to stand there. And I hope, it's, I hope it, there's enough there that I've shared in this. I, I, I just don't have the, uh, that, just the clarity this morning in my, in my mind, I think, to know whether or not I'm even uh, passing this along correctly. But let, let's just let it stand there. I gave you power to subdue the earth. That was power to sweep them all the way to a rapture. What's the rapture? Change of these bodies. So now... God had contemplated a further glory. Now in the message, hear ye him. When God made man, he made him a God. He gave him dominion over the earth. That would include the flesh, all of creation. But his fallen estate dropped that, his dominion over the earth. That's why man can't keep himself alive no matter how hard he tries. But what they lost by Adam... It was restored by Christ. Amen. Now this is where it just, there's so many statements I want to read to you. And I trust we'll be able to get to a lot of them here. I'm telling you, Calvary means more to me than it's ever meant. The, 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 the story of God sending His Son means more to me. Christmas is going to mean, I know He wasn't born in December, but it's going to mean a little bit more to me this year. To understand these things in light of the full picture. It was restored by Christ. What Adam lost was restored by Christ. Brother Rand says, everything the human race lost in Adam was redeemed when Christ. Okay? So now, what man lost, Christ is showing he's restored. So there has to be then the resurrection of the power, the potential, the promise, all that humanity held, and now some connection to the earth as a creation and the body which came from the earth. Brother Bram says in the message, led, of the, led by the Spirit. He says, and he sent his Son on earth, made in likeness of sinful flesh, and he died that we might be redeemed and brought back to God to be sons and daughters of God, to walk with him again. Notice this phrase, that missing link from the Garden of Eden. What Adam lost, Christ restored again. We often think the missing link is the serpent, correct? There's another missing link. Why? Because there had to be, the, Brother Ram said, the correct son would have been Christ. He would have eventually come forth, right? But he didn't. So that was the missing link. That son had to come. He had to be made manifest. But it couldn't come without there first being a fall. And there has to be suffering and there had to be death and there had to be sorrow before that son had come, had to come. So that's the missing link from the garden. What Adam lost, Christ restores again. So Christ restores what Adam loses. So in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, he says this is a curse to the serpent, but it prophesies of this Redeemer, the missing link. So as he's cursing the serpent and creating one missing link, he reveals the other missing link, right? Genesis 3, 14 to 15, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. And above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go. And notice what it says, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, that's a peculiar phrase, isn't it? Where does man's body come from? The dust of the earth. What has that serpent seed done to this flesh? It's caused death. That hybriding, that mongrelizing. So now the serpent sown into humanity, it's going to eat man's flesh all the days of its life. As long as that hybrid is in flesh, what does it do? It dies. Yeah. 
it dies. So God is declaring more than just you're going to slither on your belly and the dust of the earth is going to get in your mouth. But no, it also speaks to the fact that he's a flesh eater, that it takes life from man. So he says, and I'll put enmity in light of the fact that you are going to be the one that causes death to mankind. I'll put enmity between thy seed, between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the it is a he. This is a prophecy of who? Christ, who restores back everything Adam lost. So when, brother, when God now is speaking this, he says, The serpent, you're going to, be a, uh, you're going to crawl on your belly every day, all the days of your life. And he says, but now I'm going to put enmity between the seed of the woman and thy seed. And the seed of the woman is he, it is Christ. And because he's going to restore everything Adam lost, then he is going to have power to bruise thy head. He's going to have power to crush thy head. So the serpent was a flesh eater. And because of sin, all flesh is as grass and it withers away. And I, I could share more scriptures in that, but we'll just make quick reference to them. Because of this fall of mankind, his flesh becomes subject to death. A man is dying and he withers away and his life is but a vapor. But now in this prophecy of Christ, says Christ is going to crush the head of the flesh eater. He's going to crush the head of the one that brought death into mankind. He's going to destroy death. Why? Because he restores what Adam lost. Adam had power over death. He forfeited power over his body. He forfeited power over the flesh to keep it alive, to sustain it. But now in the very first prophecy of Christ, the very thing that we see come up is the fact that Christ is going to destroy death and the one that caused it. Amen. The serpent who is, eats the flesh and causes death and he's going to eat dust all the days of his life. There's going to come one that's going to have power to... Subdue. John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. Therefore doth my Father love me because... Now notice, who could say this? I lay my life down that I might take it again. Huh, what? I'm going to lay my life down, but I'm going to take it back up again. Who can do this? Who has power to do that? No man taketh it from me. But I lay it down on myself. And could you imagine those people over there who are, you know, sharpening their knives and tying knots and getting nails ready, wanting to crucify this guy. We're going to take him. We're going to take his life. And he goes, oh, you're not going to take it from me. I'm going to lay it down. Like, well, fair enough. If you just want to give yourself up and die, he's like, oh, and not only that, I'll just come right back up again. Like, who does this? Who takes his life and then take it? Who gives his life and can take it back again? This doesn't even make any sense. Surely he is a madman. But he says this, I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This is new. Any man could take his life. Any man can, uh, the, the, could uh, uh, lay his life down, put himself in a dangerous situation, and put his life in peril and act in a way that's negligent or uh, reckless and take his own life and take somebody else's life. A man can voluntarily, willingly do something to cause life to, uh, to go out of his body, but no man can reverse that. And he says, in no uncertain terms, I have power to lay down my life. I have power to give my life and I have power to give myself life again. Now, where in the world did you get that, Jesus? This commandment have I received of my Father. Amen. The commandment had been given back to, to man again. He didn't just have it because, again, he's just savvy. And he, knows, he knows molecules and he had essential oils that we don't have. I mean, it was nothing like that. He had power from the Father. The Father had given him a commandment. Multiply, replenish. Subdue the earth. I've given you power to lay down your life. I've given you commandment to take it back up again. He had received a commission of the Father. The commandment and the blessing had been revived in Christ. All that Adam had lost in the fall, Christ is proving that it restores back. Christ is proving God's plan of redemption by saying, I give you power to lay down your life and I give you power to take your life back up. I'm showing that redemption is in you. The power lays within you, Jesus. How did he have it? Why did he have it? It was given to him. A commandment, 
A blessing, an endowment was conferred upon him. This commandment have I received of my father. He, didn't even, he couldn't even brag about the power to lay his life down and to take it back up of his own volition or of his own will. It came from God. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. You don't want to leave now. This is when it's getting good. There's not a mass exodus taking place, you know, if anybody's wondering. But Jesus Christ, who's the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Now, that's a strange phrase, isn't it? First begotten of the dead. Well, you know, he's the only, he was the only begotten son of God. But now he's the first begotten of the dead, the firstborn, or it is the first to enter life. The first to raise by power given to him to immortal life. This is something that's inherent in what man was created to be and what man was created to have and to express God's power of redemption. What greater power of redemption would there be for something to have completely vanquished of life but then have power to bring the life right back up? That's what all nature testifies to. That's what it was all, the cycles of day and night, everything. God was always testifying and pointing to this. So now Christ is the first begotten, the first born from the dead, the first one to enter life by a power that was given to him. He was raised from death into not just life again, but immortal life. Though some were raised before from the dead, it was not by a power they possessed. Nor was it to eternal life. They could not raise themselves back up, nor was it to eternal life. Though many had been, I say many, though others were raised from the dead, Christ had power to give up His life, power to take it up again, because it was conferred upon Him, a blessing given to Him. So He's called the first begotten of the dead. In Colossians 1.18, And He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the first born from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. That in all things he might have the preeminence. And we're told that he that overcometh shall inherit all things. Behold, I make all things new. That in all things he might have the preeminence. It's because he's the first born from the dead. He's the first to conquer death. The first begotten of the dead. The first to enter into life. From life into death into immortality. He's the first born from the dead. And he's not called the only born from the dead. But the first begotten from the dead. The first born from the dead. The first to conquer death. Because why? The powers to be conferred upon others. Amen. He is not the only begotten from the dead. Why? There are others also who are going to share in this immortality. Amen. He's the first born from the dead. In John 13, 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands and that he was, from, come from, he was come from God and went to God. He knew all things had been given into His hands. Well, this is the power, the blessing, the promise conferred upon Him. He says in Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Yeah. The, what Adam lost in the fall, Christ is now given again. It has been conferred upon him. It is conveyed to him. Everything that he was given, Adam had, he lost. It was forfeited. It went back to God. But now Christ is proving that this power is resident in flesh again. Philippians chapter 3 verse 21. I, I, I am in an unfortunate spot in how this just laid out this morning to where I can't just stop there. I've got to just take it another step further. And it says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, because I want to nail this down, this power to subdue. Christ, who's restored all that Adam lost, He's the missing link from the garden. This commandment have I received of my Father to lay down my life, power to take it up again, the first begotten of the dead. Holding all those thoughts in your minds now, I think it all has to fit together. A word that would sweep them all the way from Eden to the rapture. The rapture relates to this body, the change of this body. Now Christ proved he had power to lay that body down and to take it up again. And then it says in Philippians 3.21, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, 
According to what? According to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Did you catch that? He's going to change our vile body into a glorified body. By what power? The glorification of our flesh is connected to His power to subdue all things. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. I've given all things are into my hands. In, in all things that he might have the preeminence. And what did it result in? He's the first begotten from the dead. He's the first born from the dead. He has conquered death and entered into immortality. He has power to lay down his life. He has power to take it up again. And now he's expressing this. That the very glorification of our body is connected with God giving him power to subdue. Adam in the beginning was be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue the earth, subdue all things. That means your body, Adam. But Adam lost the power to subdue the flesh, but it was given back to Christ. And now the power to subdue is being conveyed as a blessing upon mankind that this body shall be changed. Amen. What is it? Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He will change our bodies into a glorified body. By what power? The glorification of your flesh. The further glory to be revealed in you is connected with Christ's power to subdue. That's why Jesus, Brother Branham could say, He gave you a word to sweep you all the way from Eden to a rapture in Genesis 1.28. Notice these few statements. I, I have three of them on one slide so I could go through them very quickly here. See, I knew I needed to hurry. Have faith in God. We have the blessed assurance that someday these vile bodies will be changed and made like unto His own glorious body, whereby He's able to subdue all things unto Himself. Brother Graham just quoting the Scripture. What was the Holy Ghost given for? The corruptible bodies of those that sleep in Him shall be changed and made like unto His own glorious body. This is a glorified body. A glorified body. A glorified flesh that will never die, never rot, never age. Whereby He's able to subdue all things unto Himself. Jubilee year, the corruptible bodies of those that are asleep in Him will be changed and made like unto His own glorious body, whereby He's able to subdue all things unto Himself. Again, it's just a quoting of Philippians 3.21, but the power to change this body from flesh to glorified flesh is connected with power to what? Subdue. Amen. It's power to subdue the earth. Just as we go back and think about that again, to subdue. Christ was given power to what? To subdue. To crush or to bruise the serpent's head. It means to tread under, to dominate, to put death under your feet. To take the body and to subdue death. To subdue it to where it's no longer subject to corruption. Christ has power to dominate and tread down the effect of the serpent. His power to dominate and tread down death. He has power to subdue all things. And the glorification of our body is connected with the commandment and the blessing to subdue the earth. In the message, Queen of Sheba, the rest says Christianity is based upon not replacement, reincarnation, but resurrection. The same one went down, come up, but in the splendor of immortality. Ooh, aren't you glad that there was, there was some immortality withheld from Adam because God was saving it. He wanted to deal with death first. Sin. Make himself known. In immor in, 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 being immortal, there would have been so many things God could not have expressed to, an, uh, to other, another immortal. We had to become mortal for this splendor, for the real glory of God to be made manifest. But now... That one that went down comes up in the splendor of immortality, made like unto his own glorious body, where he's able to subdue all things unto himself. Is this beautiful to you? Isn't it wonderful just to see how these things are laid out so clearly for us in the Word of God to understand that God has given us power to bind the greatest? As it says in the message countdown, the hour will come when we, I'll take this conjunction, we will have to have rapture power. Who will have to have it? I will. You will. We will. The hour will come when we will have to have rapture power. Not only to heal the body, but to change it in a moment. Who will have the power? You will have it. You will have power to subdue. To do what? To subdue this body and change it from a mortal body to an immortal body. To take the very elements and atoms of this body which are, are, which are ingrained and sown with death. You're going to have power to change yourself in your atoms. 
very, very changed by the power to subdue. Why? You've been given power over it as a God to take the atoms and align them back upright to where they will not die. The very power of glorification resides within us. We'll have power to rapture. We'll have rapture power to change the body in a twinkling of an eye. Christ will be so real into their bodies till He can change it by His great death and what He purchased. We'll have rapture power. You have rapture power. What is it? Power to subdue. Power to change this flesh from mortal to immortality. Power to swallow up death into life. Because the Bible says in Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. We've been reading that several times already in these first few months. Satan, the flesh eater, you're going to crush his head. Why? You've been given power to... Subdue. I'm going to skip. I'm just going to skip a scripture reading where the Bible says, well, let's just read it quickly. Romans 8, 19 to 22. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Remember, the earth's purpose was left unsatisfied. From the very moment that mankind fell, creation has been groaning, waiting for all the promise, the potential, and power that Adam represented. They sensed it. They experienced it in Genesis chapter 2 when Adam walked among them and named them and empowered them and gave them purpose and was placing them. The naming of something is placing them in their position. And here's Adam placing animal life and creation in their position, giving them meaning, giving them purpose. And now all this potential that was being expressed and then the woman comes out from man and all the creation is witnessing. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't this amazing? Now there's something left groaning and the earth is left pregnant longing for something. But they're made subject in hope because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What are they longing for? The manifestation of the sons of God. Even a manifestation that was not fully made manifest in Adam but was made manifest in Christ. All creation travails, we said it last time, not because of sin, and not because man sinned, but it travails and groans for redemption because redemption is what all creation was made for. Brother Bram says in the message, unfailing realities of the living God. And when God made man in His own image, He put Him on the earth as a lesser God. Jesus declared it when He said, Is it not written in your laws that you are God's? And if they called those gods who the word of God come to, which was the prophets, how can you condemn me when I say I'm the son of God? He said, see, they just couldn't understand it. But man was put here with a dominion over the earth. He had everything under his control. Adam lost. Jesus proved that he had restored. He stopped nature. He raised the dead. He'd done everything. Now, if you could... I've been trending to this, and I just can't seem to get there. Just start thinking about all those instances of the third pool. It relates to all things. It relates to creation. It relates to the original commission. He done everything. And all the world is groaning today, the Bible said, for the manifestations of the sons of God. For God to get into His children again in reality to make things real. To bring it back to the reality of Genesis 1.20. To bring it back to the full realization of what God wanted to do, to do in the beginning. And it stumbles the people, he says. That the concept of salvation, oh, I'm a sinner, oh, I'm depraved and I'm estranged from God. And adopt me as your child and make this orphan, you know, one that could sit at your table. That doesn't stumble people. But the fact that God desired to make man God, that's what stumbles people. 
for God to get into His children and to become flesh in His bride and to make things real and the reality of God to be lived out in the flesh of His people, that's what stumbles the people. And not only does creation groan and creation cry out, longing for the manifestations of sons, but we ourselves, verse 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. Why, without that, there's not the glorification, there's not the subduing, there's not the full manifestation of what all creation was longing to see in the beginning. The body that came from earth must be subdued. It's not enough that it would be healed. It's not enough that it would even be raised from the dead to die again. But it must be changed to the original glory that God contemplated. It must be changed into the same glorious body that Jesus Christ has. That's what we're living for. We're not living for a funeral. One day we're going to have the last one. One day the last bride member is going to lay in a coffin. Why? Because it's a promise of God that will not fail. Death will be swallowed up of life. In the message, conflict between God and Satan, I'm just not going to be able to finish. And, and I know it won't stumble any of you to have to just pick back up on some of this. I want to read that statement again. But God at the beginning gave His children the atomic weapon... Because He's the infinite God. Now seeing there's going to be a conflict and there's going to be a battle, God equipped His children with the right kind of ammunition, right kind of attack, the right kind of everything that they would need, had need of that would sweep them all the way from Eden to the rapture. Can you see that a little bit better now? What was it? The Word. The Word. That's what defeats Satan is the Word. It will defeat him anywhere, any place. Now, why do we want to substitute something else when we've already got the best thing that there is? The Word. And we find Jesus on earth just to prove this was the best equipment. When Satan came in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Jesus, he never reached over with his power and tied his hands. He just took the same weapon that God gave in the Garden of Eden, His Word, and said, It is is written. It's written. And he punched him right out of the ring with it. That's right, because it's God's best. Amen. And do you realize what Brother Branham said has been restored back to you? The Word. Amen. The Word has been restored back to you. Listen, that's what must have the preeminence. That must be what we're connected to and tied to. Uh, above even certain gifts and certain manifestations and certain charismas and outpourings and things that can move upon our flesh. Those things are wonderful. The gifts of the Spirit are in the Word. These certain powers of prophecy and speaking in tongues, they're lovely and God communicates to us through those things. But listen, let the Word have preeminence. That's the best. It's the Word that will bring the results. Brother Branham says in Future Home, and I, I, I had a few more statements and some more things I wanted to amplify in it, but we'll just stop here. He says, Adam was to multiply and replenish the earth. Noah was, after the new world was destroyed, was to multiply and replenish the earth. Can't you see what the serpent seed is? What replenished the earth? You get it? You see how Satan got to Eve? That's why death has reigned on earth ever since. And heavens, earth, beast, atmosphere is all cursed of God because of it. That's the curse because Satan got to this first. Jesus came to redeem it back to the Father. In order to do this, He became part of it. And from that very dust, the part Jesus was Himself, being redeemed through Him, all of the attributes of God are redeemed. With the earth. Isn't redemption beautiful? All the attributes of God. Do you know that's who you are? All the attributes of God are redeemed with the earth. And he teaches how God redeems the person is the same way he redeems the earth. Listen, saints, we are ordained to satisfy and subdue the earth. This word, this word has been committed unto you. Why? You are a redeemed attribute of God. 
through Christ, through the, even the redemption of the very dust of the earth, power has been given to you to subdue as an attribute of God. Therefore, I believe we could take the word, which is the best weapon, the best equipment, and we can fight the devil with it. Whatever you have need of, you can use this word to do it. We have been given power. This earth, this body which came from this earth, it must be subdued. God bless you. Let's stand to our feet this, this morning. We just eked in in the morning. We got finished before noon. <clears throat> I don't have much breath or energy to worship. I trust it wouldn't be an offense if we just cut it short. <clears throat> but let's worship Him in that song. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. I want to ask you today, and I want you to raise a hand. Do you know that God is with you? Do you know that He loves you? He's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. We have urgent needs within our body. Sister Ruth Correa's dad is in the hospital struggling with severe COVID symptoms. Brother Albert Morales is at home, a very strong man, very able, capable man, is struggling with sickness. Others in our church suffering from different maladies and different afflictions. I have no doubt that a word has been committed to us that we could take and use against any sickness. If we've been given power to subdue the earth, that means any sickness resident in your flesh is subject to the power to subdue. That's even what divine healing represents. Divine healing is just a token. It's just a, a, a signification of power over death. Why? Because that would be the greatest. That's the most wonderful power there could be is the power to lay down your life and take it right back up again. If there's power over death, there is no power over you. Therefore, let us stand confident in the grace that God has given us as the elect. Stand for loved ones. Stand for those who have needs today. And as we pray, let's present our token. Let's go to prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, today, those of us who are able to be here in service, we have needs. We have our own needs in our flesh. We're weak. We're tired, Lord. Some of us fighting different afflictions. And those of us who are present, we have longings and desires for ourselves financially, emotionally, physically. Lord, we have questions and perplexities. But Lord, we stand here today for others. And Lord, we stand for Sister Ruth's dad. We stand for Brother Albert. We stand for Brother James. We stand for Sister Morgan. Lord, we stand for anybody in our church today who is absent from us. We stand for those who are caring for their loved ones. Lord, we're not standing for ourselves, but we stand before the throne of grace as bearers of your presence, as believers in your word, as those who hold the token and hold it high. And we claim now healing in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We claim these redemptive blessings. Lord, what are these redemptive blessings? It's the very restoration of what man lost in Genesis chapter 1. Lord, I pray today for healing in our body. I pray for a raising up. We speak power over sickness. We speak power over disease. We speak power over sin. And I pray, Lord, that you would take feeble bodies and raise them up. Take lungs and put breath into them. Take inflammation and may it be gone. The loss of taste, Lord, may it be restored. The loss of smell, may it be restored back. Lord, whatever the malady may be, free things up, loose things, Father, I pray. We're standing upon a promise without doubt. Lord, there's not one doubt in my heart today believing that it shall be done. Father, I ask now that you would give strength to your body for we are standing upon a promise that this bride has been restored to a position to be able to subdue. May all things be subdued, Father. Commit it to you now praying for your grace and your blessing upon your people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.